Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Beam Sensitive Samples and EDS Analysis. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Um, at the bottom of your audience console, you should have several application widgets you can use. If you have questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question there. We'll try to answer these during the webcast. But if we need a bit more fuller answers needed or we run out of time, you'll receive an answer by email. All the questions are captured. A copy of today's slide deck and some additional materials are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder. The, you can expand the slide area by clicking on the maximize icon in the top right or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark and it covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after we're done, and you can access it by using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. And with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jens Hoffelsen. I'm an applications engineer with EDAX, primarily on the EDS side of things. Um, my background is in physics and optics, but uh, I've been playing around with uh, electron microscopes and EDS for, for quite a while now. Um, and today we're going to cover some of the common sample or common challenges you can uh, experience when you're trying to do EDS analysis on a variety of different things. So let's get started with the presentation. So first of all, we're just going to cover some of the very basics, the components of X-ray spectra and EDS basics. Some of you might have seen this before if you attended our webinars previously. Um, I'm going to keep it very brief, but there's a few things that we're discussing when we get to the sensitive, feed sensitive samples and things like that, that we need to tie back in order to understand it. There's a link for the previous webinars in the resources section. So if you want to explore this in more detail, you can go back and look at some of those webinars. But we'll start by some of the basics. And then we will take a look at the most common problem, the non-conductive samples, where we'll look at the effects of charging and some of the things we can do to get rid of it, coding, variable pressure, and we'll also discuss beam deceleration mode. Then we'll go on to actually damaging our samples. We have two examples today. One is salt, common table salt, sodium chloride. And the other one is a sample containing bacteria. So we'll start by looking at what does, how do we actually damage the sample, what the images look like. And then we'll go into potential problems and then review the samples a little bit later with the exact damage mechanism for that given sample. We'll talk very briefly about scan strategies for mapping what you can do when you have these beam sensitive samples, how to avoid damaging it too much, and finally summarize everything. But EDS basics first, components of the X-ray spectrum. So an X-ray spectrum looks something like this. And it has two primary components. One's the background, and the other is the characteristic peaks. The background comes from electrons being accelerated or decelerated inside the sample, and that's generally a continuum emission of radiation, whereas the characteristic peaks are generated by the transitions between the electronic states and the atoms. So the characteristic peaks is what we use to determine what and how much of it is in the sample. Whereas the background in some cases is just considered an annoyance, an artifact, um, but as we'll show you today, there's a lot of useful information, information hidden in the background as well. So the background or the Bramstrahlung. Any charged particle undergoing acceleration will emit radiation. That's uh, a basic Thing that falls out of the Maxwell equations. We're not going to go into that level of detail. But you can think of it as if we have a nuclei and we have the incoming electron from the uh, electron beam, and depending on how close that gets to the nuclei, 
it will experience different Coulomb interactions. So we have the positive nuclei that's pulling the negative electron. So we can have the trajectory of the electron changing depending on how close it is to the nuclei. The closer we are, the stronger the Coulomb interaction, the more we change the direction or accelerate, decelerate the electron. The energy or X-rays emitted can be described by Kramer's law, which looks something like this. So the number of um, X-rays at a given photon energy will depend on the average atomic number of the sample, a constant, and the incident beam energy. We plot it, it looks something like this. So one thing to note here is that the background tails off and drops to zero once we hit the incident beam energy. We can't generate any X-rays with energy higher than that of the incoming electron. The other thing to note is that this does not look like a real background. This is what we see in the spectrum, the blue line you have down at the bottom. The Kramer's law suggests that we go close to infinity once we go to very low energies, but we see that we actually drop off to zero in the real spectrum. That's because Kramer's, Kramer's law describes what's being emitted from a single atom, whereas the X-ray spectrum is what's being seen and detected by the X-ray detector. So there's a difference there. And we use an um, equation to describe the background in the team software that looks something like this. It's basically a series expansion of Taylor's law. You can see some of the terms are, sorry, Kramer's law. Some of the terms are the same. And we add a couple of additional terms in there. So the important part here is that we plot it, we see we get dropping off to zero, as we see in the spectrum. And the important part is the background shape depends on the excitation voltage, same as in Kramer's law. But we added a few more things in there. The sample composition. As I said, Kramer's law describes what's being emitted from an atom. We are interested in what actually gets to the detector. So in order to go to the detector, it needs to escape from the sample. So there's some uh, absorption there. And it also depends on the detector efficiency, depending on what window you have and whether your detector is contaminated, exact model of it, you will have different detector efficiencies, which will affect the background shape. So all that is taken into account in the model we apply to the uh, background in our team software. This will depend a little bit on the different vendors. Some of them simply filter out the backgrounds has advantages and disadvantages. Um, we model the background. That has advantages and disadvantages, too. But especially for the charging samples, I would like to highlight some of the advantages today. The characteristic peaks. Um, these are generated by transitions inside the atom. So if we have the incoming electron from the electron beam, there's a probability of us hitting one of the core shell electrons in the atom and simply knocking it out. So we now have an excited state in the atom. We have one of the core shells being unoccupied. That's not an energetically favorable state. So what will happen is one of the outer shell electrons will drop down to fill that hole. And there's a difference in binding energy between these shells. So the excess energy comes out as an X-ray. In this case, it's a K alpha because the hole was created in the K shell. And the electron that dropped down came from one shell out. We call it an alpha for the first letter in the Greek alphabet. So this is the L to K transition. If we had an M to K transition, it would be two shells out, and we call that one K beta, beta being the second letter in the Greek alphabet. This is the um, seek bond notation, and that's the standard for EDS. A little simplified, because these shells are not just simply the onion model as we sometimes apply to it. There's orbitals involved here. So the K shell, we only have the S orbital. The L shell, we have S and P with spin up and spin down. And we have two different transitions between the L and the K shell. So we have a K alpha one and a K alpha two. Somebody might be wondering what happened to the S to S transition. And then we get into quantum mechanics. That one's dipole forbidden. So basically it has a 
um, transition probability of zero. We don't see that one. If we add in the M shell, it gets even more complicated. Now we have SP and D orbitals. And here we have the K betas. Um, but as you can see again, there's a beta 1 and a beta 3. It's named here. And if we go to the L transitions, here we have the L alpha 1, L alpha 2. Here we have the K betas, again, but from the different orbitals. And here is what gets a little more tricky, and you can't use the logic of the seek bond notation, really. So normally we say the L alpha means we have an L, and then it's one shell out, meaning it's the M shell. And then L beta is L, and then two shells out, which would put us in the N shell. That's not completely true. It's just different orbitals involved within the M and L shell. So seek bond notation is nice and simple, but don't start thinking too much about it or applying it uh, with too much rigor. Another aspect of the ionization is the ionization cross-section, which is basically how many ionizations will occur per electron per atom per area. We can look up these uh, equations. One of the good sources for it is the um, John Goldstein book, Scanning Electron Microscopy and X-ray Microanalysis. A bunch of terms. Depends on the uh, number of electrons, a couple of constants. Again, depends on the primary electron energy and the critical ionization energy. The critical ionization energy is basically how much energy do we need to knock out the, um, the core shell. At this point, we would like to introduce a term called the overvoltage that we often use in EDS. How much higher is our incident beam energy compared to the, um, the energy required to knock out the core shell or the critical ionization energy? So if we plug that into the equation and plot it out, we get something like this. So this is important, as you'll see when we get to the charging samples. Um, if we have too low overvoltage, we get a small cross-section, which means we get poor excitation and small peaks. Ideally, we should be right around a factor of two. So if we have a... Uh, at precision where it tends, takes 10 kV to knock out the uh, core shell electrons, ideally we should have an excitation voltage of 20 kV, and that's where we'll get the best excitation. So that's a few basics. Now get, let's get into the stuff we actually want to talk about. Start with non-conductive samples. So we have the vacuum inside the chamber. We have our sample. We have the electrons coming down from the electron beam. Ideally, we get electron scattering inside, we get backscatter, we get x-rays, we get secondary electron signal, all that stuff that we need to get good images and x-ray data. The problem with non-conductive samples is that the electrons cannot move freely around inside the sample. So essentially, they're stuck. They tend to stay put at the surface, and if you have a bunch of charged particles sitting around, they will generate an electrical field on the surface. So now you have an electrical, negative electrical field on the surface, and you have a negative particle coming in. So that means we're decelerating the incoming electrons. They are not hitting the sample surface with the energy we gave them in the, uh, in the electron gun by applying an, an excitation voltage. We can see that in the images, if charging is bad enough, this is a glass particle at 15 kV, and these are some of the typical charging artifacts. Um, this is actually a sphere, hard to tell from this image. But you can see you get bright spots, dark spots, um, stretching in certain regions, and as you move your beam around, the brightness and contrast will change on the sample. So that's the image, but if we look at the X-ray spectrum, this might be a little hard to see, but uh, that's sort of on purpose. This is the glass, so there's silicon, oxygen, some aluminum, and a few other things in there. But I collected the spectrum with 15 kV of excitation voltage, and now I'm going to scale up so we can see the background. And here we see the background tails off pretty early. According to Kramer's law, the background should tail off at the incident beam energy. 
and we're hitting the sample, we believe, with 15 kV. But we can see from the background tail, it drops off right around 4.5, 5 ish kV, which means the electrons hitting the sample only have about 5 kV of energy, meaning we have about 10 kilovolts of charge buildup on the surface of this particle. And we can see that directly from the background. So the background can tell you if your sample is charging and how much it's charging just by looking at where does it tail off. So what do we do about it? Um, we can apply a coating to the sample to get rid of the charge. Usually we do carbon coating for EDS analysis. So here we have the silicon dioxide sample, um, again a glass at 15 kV. There's a carbon peak because it's carbon coated. And if I again rescale this one, we can see the background continues all the way out to 15 kV. There's no charging, no char field buildup on the sample. Of course, I added an extra carbon layer on top, but for most EDS vendors, you can do a correction for that. You can include it in the model of the spectrum and still do quant analysis. In our team software, there's a carbon coat correction, looks something like this. Um, you can enter the thickness directly if you know it, and we hit the quantification button, and it comes out, yeah, this is a silicon dioxide. So the atomic ratio is pretty much spot on, as we can see. We always recommend carbon. I know a lot of people have gold spotter coders. Gold is great for imaging. It is not great for EDS analysis. You're putting a very heavy element on top of the sample. It's very hard to calculate exactly what the attenuation is in that layer, um, especially in the light element range. So carbon is definitely the preferred coding mechanism. We've been asked several times to include gold coding in our modeling as well, and we're reluctant to do it because it is not the best coding to use. Um, one of the arguments is often, well, I want to analyze carbon, so I don't want a carbon code, I want a gold code. That doesn't really work because gold still has a uh, low energy overlap with carbon. So even there, you have an overlap, you're still messing up your carbon signal. Um, for some a non-conductive sample containing carbon, where you want to do carbon analysis, my usual recommendation is to carbon coat the sample anyway. If you have one of the nice new carbon coders, you can actually measure the thickness. You can enter it into the software with the exact thickness, and the software can take that into account and quantify any residual signal in the carbon peak as containing to the sample. If you're not fortunate enough to have one of the new fancy ones, like we do here, or meaning we're not fortunate, then it's just a couple of carbon rods or carbon fiber. You crank a current through it and it evaporates. In that case, I take two samples, one that has no carbon in it, I prefer a silicon substrate, and code it at the same time with the sample I want to analyze. I then take my unknown, go in and measure, and in our software, you can back calculate the carbon coding thickness. So now you have it normalized, even though you don't have a um, direct measure on your coder. Common coding is definitely preferred for EDS analysis. So that's one way. If you're fortunate, fortunate enough to have a microscope with variable pressure mode, that can be a great help too. The way it works is you bleed a bit of gas into the system, and that will carry charge away from the surface. So here we have our charging sample. We have oxygen, gas, air, nitrogen, whatever it is we bleed in there hits the sample surface and carries the charge away, and the effect is quite pronounced. Here's my class sphere at 15 kV in high vac, and go to variable pressure mode. This is about 40 pascal. And now we can clearly see it is a sphere, and we start to see the uh, surface contamination, a few things like that, on the, uh, on the particle, on the sphere. And if we look at the spectra, here I normalize to the oxygen peak. We compare the variable pressure mode to the high vacuum mode. You can see there's a very big difference in the peak height. And this comes back to the ionization cross-section. Because when my sample is charging, I have a lower landing voltage than I believe, which means my 
over voltage is much, much lower. If you look at the high vacuum, it's hard to tell, but in the variable pressure one, you can easily see the calcium and potassium peaks out in the higher energy range. But in high vac, I had about 15 kilo, or 10 kilovolts of charge buildup, which means I don't even have enough excitation voltage to excite those peaks, and that's why I get the lower peak uh, peak height. So the reduction of landing voltage leads to a different over voltage, which leads to very different peak heights when you compare uh, a charging sample to a uh, conductive sample or one where you have the charge compensation. A warning about the variable pressure mode. Here I just showed the model of the beam scattering inside the, uh, the sample, but you do have beam scattering with the gas inside the chamber as well. Typical pressures are about 10, 40, 60 pascals, something like that. And the electron beam will collide with the gas molecules. That leads to reduced signal because not all of your electrons will be hitting the sample, so you get fewer X-ray counts, worse SEM images. But it can also lead to tailing uh, of the electron beam, so it actually hits outside the region of interest. So you might see strange peaks showing up when you're in variable pressure mode. If you want to figure out if that's truly from the region you're analyzing, try doubling or half, go to half the pressure and see if those peaks change. Luckily, the effect is pretty much linear. So if you have something strange, go to double pressure and the peak goes to double height then it's an artifact and not truly part of the sample. Another thing though, if you don't want to code and you don't have variable pressure, there's still an option. Here I collected the same glass sphere at different currents. So 245 picoamp, 130 picoamp, 45 picoamp, and 10 picoamp. Again, we can see changes in the peak heights Again, we have different charges on the sample, and that results in different ionization cross-sections because we have different old voltages. If I go in and look at the background tail, you can see at the high currents, the cutoff is at lower energies, and as we go to lower and lower currents, it moves further and further out. We also get a more noisy background because we get fewer counts. So, here I compare the variable pressure where we have full charge compensation to the 10 picoamp and 45 picoamp spectra. And we can see if we go as low as 10 picoamp, we pretty much get rid of the charge on the surface of the sample, get the same spectra as if we were in variable pressure mode. So by reducing your beam current, you can hit a steady state where there's no charge buildup on the sample. That is, you can avoid coding and you can avoid variable pressure mode. Problem is, the number of X-rays depends heavily on the, or it's linear with the amount of electrons you're putting down, which is depending on the uh, beam current. So if you go to 10 picoamps, you'll probably have to collect your spectrum for a very long time to get good statistics. But if the alternative is not getting the right data, then, well, taking longer is uh, a good option to have. One of the things we hear from the microscope guys is, well, you don't really need to code. You don't need variable pressure because we have this beam deceleration mode or gentle beam or stage bias, whatever they call it, depending on the vendor. The way it works is, again, you have your sample. In normal mode, you have your stage connected to ground, so we get rid of all the charge on the sample. The electrons can hit the sample and run down to ground. If you apply a stage bias, a gentle beam, or whatever the term is, basically you hook it up to a power supply instead. Then you apply a voltage to your sample. And now your electrons come down and hit the sample with a lower landing voltage. It's very nice from a optical point of view. You get pretty images. You can reduce some of the charging effects. But for EDS, here we compare the spectra uh, this is a 316 stainless steel, just to have some more peaks to show the difference. And compared no deceleration, one, two, three, four, five kilovolts of beam deceleration on the stage. And we can see we have very different peak heights. 
because we are reducing the landing voltage. Look at the background tails and you can see I use 15 kV and for each step up I go to lower and lower landing voltage on the stage. So the beam deceleration is great from an optics point of view. If you want to collect images, by all means use it, but it does not help us in EDS. One of the bigger problems is that often the microscope will only tell the EDS side the excavation voltage and not the landing voltage. And that can be a problem because now we think we have a 15 kV spectrum, but in fact it's only 10 kV and that can lead to wrong quant results. So if you are using beam deceleration and EDS, make sure you enter the right value for the excavation voltage in the EDS software if it's not being communicated correctly from the microscope. Essentially, the beam deceleration will have the same effect as a charging sample, except now you can control the charge buildup. So, for non-conductive samples, coating, low beam current, or variable pressure are the preferred options. But, let's start um, breaking some stuff up. Regular salt. Um, sodium chloride. I went to our cafeteria, grabbed some salt, crushed it a little bit, and stuck it onto a stuff with carbon tape. And this is one of the smaller grains that I crushed into a powder. This is before exposing it to the uh, high current that I'm going to use, so relatively low current just to get a pretty picture. This is just to show it is actually salt, sodium chloride. Um, there's a bit of carbon and oxygen in there, probably from the um, carbon substrate when I was crushing everything. And then I hit it with 25 kilovolts, 57 nanoamps, a quite high beam current, for 10 minutes. This is what happens. And 20 minutes, my salt grain looks very, very different. Um, basically, it looks like we're boiling things off here. Before talking about exactly what the damage mechanism is, let's take a look at another sample. Um, these are my bacteria. It's a probiotic nutritional supplement. So it's uh, bacteria in a viscous solution with some different stuff added in there. Uh, I took it and just put a drop on a silicon wafer, pumped it down, so evaporate everything. This is a 10K Mac and I collected videos with each frame being one second. Got the videos, and I collected at 15 kilovolts, 264 picoamps, five kilovolts, 264 picoamps, and then 15 kilovolts, 68 picoamps, five kilovolts, and 68 picoamps. And if you look carefully at the videos as they loop around, you can see at the high beam currents, damage happens very quickly. Within the first few frames of the video, a um, couple of frames, maybe two for the 15 kV 264 picoamp, at more like five, six, seven frames at 5 kV, we have significant beam damage and the sample doesn't change anything after that. The 68 picoamp takes a little longer at 15 kV, but the interesting one's the 5 kV 68 picoamp. You have to pay close attention to that one to actually see the damage. It's only really apparent when the video starts to loop over again. So we are damaging the sample, but it's much, much slower than at the other settings. The other ones, we burn everything off in a matter of a few seconds. But the 68 picoamp one at 5 kV, you can see it takes quite a while before we actually damage the sample. So obviously we are damaging the sample here and we can see it depends on the extraction voltage and it depends on the beam current. So what are the damage mechanisms? Well, there's two primary factors contributing to the beam damage. One is the number of the electrons and the other is the energy of the electrons. So the number of electrons, we put down some beam current. The beam current is the amount of charge per time. I apologize, we get into a bit of physics here. One nanoamp is one times 10 to the minus ninth kilom per second. One electron has a charge of roughly 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th kilom. 
which means one nanoamp is 6.24 times 10 to the 9th electrons per second. That's how many electrons are hitting our sample every single second at one nanoamp of mean current. The other aspect of it, the energy of the individual electron depends on the potential or the field it travels through. In the SEM, that's the dx voltage. So the energy is the charge times the potential. And if we have 15 kV acceleration voltage, we have an energy of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th Coulomb, the charge of the electron, times 16 kV, which means we have 2.4 times 10 to the minus 15th joule, or 15 kV energy. So with one nanoamp of beam current, 15 kV of acceleration voltage, we're putting 6.24 billion electrons down per second and each of those electrons have an energy of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 15 joule. And that comes out to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 joules per second, or 15 microwatts. I apologize, there's a, a font change there. That milli was supposed to be a micro, so it's not milliwatts, it's microwatts. So we're putting a little bit of uh, energy into a sample, but it doesn't seem like that much. We're talking microwatts here. Let's assume that all this goes into heat. So let's assume we have a nickel sample, one nanoamp, 15 kV of acceleration voltage, kV, not KEV, and a probe radius of 10 nanometers. I model that in the Casino Monte Carlo simulation software we get that about 50% of the beam energy will de be deposited within the 130 nanometers of the surface, and the width of this region is defined by the probe size. We can calculate the mass by knowing the density and the volume, and we can calculate the energy it requires to change the temperature by knowing the heat capacity and the mass. We'll plug that together. Temperature change is the energy we put in divided by the heat capacity, the density, and the volume. Nickel, we can look these values up, and we can plug it all in. Half of the uh, 15 microwatts going into the sample, and we end up with a temperature increase of 1.46 times 10 to the 11th Kelvin. That's a lot. That's way beyond just melting the sample. This is um, quite unrealistic, really. Heating is not the primary damage mechanism in this. Only a very small fraction of the energy we put into the sample actually goes into the heat. And even when we do heat the sample, it doesn't stay put within this 130 nanometers. If it's a bulk sample in an SEM, you have three directions it can dissipate to. So you typically end up with a couple of degrees heating at most. Uh, TEM samples is a little worse because they're thin, so you only have heat uh, convection in two, um, two dimensions. So you get more heating in a TEM, but still, typically heating is not the primary damage mechanism. Here we assumed all the energy goes into heat. That's not true, because we also get an SEM image. So some of the energy goes into backscatter and secondary electrons. We get an X-ray spectrum, so a lot of this energy goes into generating X-rays, and you also have cathode luminescence and other energy loss mechanisms. We are not boiling the sample in the two, um, two examples I'm showing you. It's other stuff that's going on. This is not saying that heat is not a factor. Sometimes you do heat your sample, but typically it's not the primary damage mechanism. So what is going on? Back to our salt. So this is what it looked like after blasting it for 20 minutes with 57 nanoamps. If I go in and collect an X-ray map of this, this is no longer salt. This is sodium and chlorine, not sodium chloride. Well, it, I, my guess is the chlorine in this map is still bound to the sodium. It's just underneath. But these round spheres we see on top, that's pure sodium. What is happening here is that we ionize the um, material with the electron beam. We do that when we knock out a core shell and we get an X-ray and as it drops down, there's a chance we still leave the, uh, the atom in an ionized state with one of the valence shells being uh, ionized. 
So essentially, we have a chance of breaking the bonds created by the valence electrons in the material. And that's what we're doing in this salt sample. So these bond vacancies can diffuse within the material. You get void buildup. And ultimately, you get mass loss as the chlorine is disassociated from the sodium and goes into gas phase. We're basically making chlorine uh, gas inside our SEM. And we have the sodium left over. This one is a damage mechanism that's uh, mostly dominant in sodium, potassium, fluorides, chlorides, and bromides. Um, as you saw, I'm at 57 nanoamp. This is not something that happens instantaneously. But if you're working at high beam currents, it can be significant. It can also occur in oxides, not as dominant, but it can be an effect. If you're doing microprobe analysis where you're usually working at high beam currents, this is a potential serious problem, that you're basically breaking the bonds and you have mass loss inside your sample. The polymer, or the, uh, sorry, the probiotics, I don't believe that's the same damage mechanism. If um, most of you that's worked on microscopes will be familiar with this one. You scan a reduced area, then when you zoom out and go out of reduced area mode, you see this black box that's left over. That's carbon contamination. Often you'll see this dark pattern with prolonged exposure, and it's typically because you have residual carbohydrates in your vacuum chamber, and that's being polymerized by the energetic electron beam. So you have a bunch of small carbon molecules, carbon chains floating around in there, you hit it with the electron beam, and you get longer chains that deposit on the surface. Um, at this point, I'd like to point out the data I'm showing here, most of it was collected at, uh, on a Tescan Mira microscope. We had a workshop with Tescan recently. They were kind enough to bring a microscope up here for the workshop and even kinder to leave it for us to play around with for a little bit. Fortunately, they won it back in a couple of weeks, but um, that's the one I've been using for, for all this data. Um, there's a link in the resources section for the microscope. And the one we have here comes with all the bells and whistles, including variable pressure, beam deceleration, and interestingly enough, a plasma cleaner. So to avoid something like this, you want to make sure that you don't put dirty samples in there. Don't touch them with your fingers before putting them into the chamber. The oils in your fingerprints will evaporate and go into carbohydrate that you can now deposit. You also want to make sure you have a clean chamber, and that's where the plasma cleaner comes in. So you can run the plasma cleaner. It will remove the carbohydrates. You can actually clean up these squares even after you deposit them. On the test can, it's an uh, Evactron carbon cleaner. Uh, the one we have in our lab is an IDSS uh, plasma cleaner that we can switch between the microscopes and also have an ASHA chamber for it. Um, both of those are described in the resources as well. So this can be reduced, this artifact, but reducing it won't help for our probiotic sample. So for this one, it's mostly, it's probably the polymerization that's the primary problem. It could potentially be bond breaking as well, but unlikely, probably just polymerization. Bond breaking is simply when you already have a long carbon chain then hit it with the electron, you break the bonds, and end up with smaller carbon chains. The videos of the probiotics show that uh, the damage is affected by the current, or the number of electrons, but also the beam energy. And that's pretty easy to understand. Um, more electrons, more energy, more damage. The excavation voltage part of it, yes, you have less energy per electron, but we saw a 5 kV and a high beam current. It still happened relatively fast. But if we simulate a 200 nanometer carbon film on top of silicon structure at 15 kV and 5 kV, you can see at 5 kV, a lot more of the energy is deposited right at the surface. At 15 kV, we basically shoot straight through the film. At 5 kV, it's much more surface confined. But 5 kV, we polymerize the surface of the film and slowly work our way down um, through, the, uh, through the bulk of the film. So that's probably why it takes much longer to have full damage at 5 kB. Quick side note, this is not only a problem, it can also be an advantage. If you do e-beam lithography, this is basically what you're doing. 
In PMMA, you do bond breaking, and in uh, HSQ, you do cross-linking of the structure. So it can be used to an advantage as well, and not just a problem. So what do we do uh, if we want to map out our probiotics here? I collected a couple of maps at 5 kV with 50 milliseconds dwell for each pixel and at, with 650 milliseconds dwell per pixel. Collected for the same amount of time, same beam current. The only difference is how long I dwell per pixel and thus how many times do I repeat the frame to average it up. So, after this map is done, at 5 kV, 50 milliseconds, yes, there's beam damage, but it's not as pronounced as if I use the long dwell. The idea here is raster over your sample fast, so you don't expose any one region for an extended period of time, which then gives the uh, sample more time to recover after being exposed to a dose. And, oops, sorry. And the maps we get out of it, well, if you collect for the same amount of time, the statistical quality of the maps is going to be exactly the same. There's really no need to do a long dwell time or no benefit to doing it. So going to a short dwell time will give you less beam damage overall. Of course, it will still accumulate over time, um, but it will take a little bit longer with fast raster than with slow raster. Another thing, though, here I took a 10 kV, 200 millisecond high beam current, 5 kV, 50 millisecond low beam current. I forgot to write down the beam current for these. But you can see at the 10 kV, I'm, I'm damaging the sample. It's already starting to bubble up and cross-link, even just acquiring the electron image for it. And after the scan is done, we can see I have completely polymerized the, uh, the carbon in my top image. The lower one, I still have quite a bit of it retained of the structure. But if you look at the EDS maps, my top one, where I have high beam current and higher activation voltage and can generate more x-rays, my carbon map, I can now start to see the uh, polymerized chains of carbon. I have very good signal-to-noise ratio, but the low activation voltage, low beam current, I have relatively low uh, signal-to-noise ratio. The interesting one is actually the nitrogen. The bacteria in my sample contain nitrogen. And if I try to find bacteria based on the low excavation voltage, low beam current map, I'm going to be hard pressed. There's not really enough signal to noise ratio in that one. But if you look at the higher excavation voltage, high beam current, very easily go in and see now where's my bacteria at and the nitrogen map shows up very nicely. And if I go in and find one of the bacteria, we see it here on the left-hand side, that brown um, well, oval-shaped structure you see in there. Yes, I have a bunch of cross-linked polymer on top of it, and you can easily see beam damage and the uh, burn patterns or the beam dwell patterns on the right-hand side of the image. But I now get a nice nitrogen map of my bacteria. So. Yes, you can damage a sample, but does it matter? In this case, I'm looking for the nitrogen and looking for my bacteria. It doesn't matter if I burn off the polymer. That's one of the things to remember. Do you really need to have your sample intact for the EDS part of it? You might just want to acquire a nice SEM image and then cross-link or burn off, polymerize, whatever you want to do with the sample to get the EDS data out of it. So, in summary, Non-conductive samples, you should take the reduced landing voltage into account. You can actually see in your background tail if a given sample is charging. If you don't have any options for reducing the charge, tell the EDS software what the actual landing voltage is if it doesn't detect it automatically. That will still give you more reliable quantification than just assuming the microscope will take care or the EDS software will take care of it. Most of the time, the model will just assume the microscope tells me it's 15 kV, thus my excitation is at 15 kV. If you have 10 kV charging buildup, enter 5 kV in your EDS software, you'll get much better results. Ideally, though, you want to carbon coat or go to variable pressure or very low beam currents, but that's going to take time.
heating can introduce damage and drift in images, but most of the time it is not of important, especially in SEMs. TEMs can be a little worse, but most of the time it's not the primary damage mechanism. Even though the images might look like you're melting things, often that's not really what's going on. For polymers, carbons, oxygens, um, organic materials, polymerization and cross-linking is typically what is happening in the sample. That is by far the most common damage mechanisms. Um, the mass loss we saw for the sodium chloride is a damage mechanism as well, but not as common. In general, going to shorter dwell times, faster raster can reduce the damage, it won't prevent it, it will reduce it. It will still build up over time depending on what kind of sample you're looking at, but it can be enough to get you a decent signal without fully cross-linking or polymerizing your sample or burning it off as in the case of the sodium chloride. But before going all through all these steps with low voltage, low current, fast dwell time, um, think about is it needed? EDS doesn't care about bonding configurations. And unless we're moving the atoms around or seeing mass loss, as with the sodium chloride, consider whether the sample damage will actually affect your data and your conclusions. Yeah, I wouldn't put an image of my bacteria with everything fully cross-linked in a publication, but I would probably consider acquiring a nice image on the SEM with everything optimized to avoid beam damage, and then just crank it up for EDS analysis to find out where do I actually have my uh, have my different elements at in the map. Um, very high beam currents. You should be a little careful, as the sodium chloride showed you, um, but that's usually when you get into the 50s um, nanoamps that that happens within a reasonable amount of time. That's mostly WDS work or um, microprobe stuff, but in TEMs, you also have a much, much higher current density. So in that case, you can see this mass loss um, quite rapidly. So TEM is a slightly different beast uh, when it comes to damage mechanisms. For more details, I would uh, recommend the, the reference I have down here at the, uh, at the bottom, um, an Egerton paper, um, where they specifically deal with um, damage mechanisms in both SEM and TEM. I think that was it for me. Um, a few additional resources here, and I will now start looking at um, at some of the Q and A questions here. Okay, uh, a lot of people tend to think that the beam current and probe size has an effect on the size of the interaction volume. Um, that is to some extent true and in some ways not. Uh, again, I would recommend going to the resource, um, question, uh, resource section. We did a webinar on, I think it was called low KV and high, actually, or sorry, high spatial resolution mapping, where I go over a few of those things. I know people say that high beam current gives you a larger interaction volume. I would tend to disagree a little bit. It depends on how we define it. Um, if we think interaction volume pure in C going into the sample, then no. If we talk about full spatial resolution, X, Y interaction volume as well, a larger probe size will give you, well, a larger beam on the sample and you will start to lose resolution. So you have, say we penetrate half a micron into the sample. Instead of penetrating half a micron in a very small area, you're now penetrating half a micron in the larger area. So in C interaction volume, I don't believe that it actually increases the interaction volume. But if you're looking at high spatial resolution, trying to do mapping of small structures, then the probe size can become a problem and adverse to your resolution in the images. Again, I covered a bit more detail in the, um, in the I believe it's low actuation voltage and high spatial resolution webinar. Uh, 
there's a question of when is a uh, high KV beam beneficial? There is uh, several cases. For one thing, um, if you're looking at elements with high energy transitions, so I showed the cross section curve, uh, ionization cross section, saying that ideally you want an actuation voltage of two times the uh, energy line you're looking at. So if we are looking at something like germanium and want to look at the K line, germanium is uh, germanium K is at 9.88 keV. So ideally we want something like 20 kilovolts on that in order to uh, to get good excitation of the K line. In general, you get better quant results, more precise results by using the K lines rather than the low energy lines and you avoid overlaps. So in that case, definitely high actuation voltage would be a benefit. The problem comes when you have both light and heavy elements in the same sample. You can't have two times over voltage for carbon at 277 EV and iron at 6.4 keV at the same time. So for that, you need to hit a compromise. Uh, there's a question about ionization damage getting worse at lower voltages, um, especially for TEMs. Again, I would, uh, I would refer to the paper I showed at the second to last slide, because there's, um, there's some differences in the damage mechanisms, um, whether it's in TEM or an SEM. The ionization damage I saw, that, uh, or was referring to the mass loss, it's not ionization because of the high energy shells being ionized. It's actually the, the valence uh, electrons that's ionized. So it's more like a 7 EV ionization, uh, if I remember correctly. So there's a difference between what you would do with a TEM and an SEM. Um, your interaction volume is also going to be very different. You're not localized to the surface of your bulk in the same way in a TEM as you are in an SEM. You shoot through the entire thing, um, and basically the entire sample is your interaction volume. Um, there's a lot of finicky details to it. A lot of those are explained in that paper, so I would, um, I would suggest looking up that paper. Uh, there is a question about plasma cleaning and polymer windows. So this is a this is a quite valid question. Um, actually, my this year's M and M poster, I did some tests on that. The official company line is don't clean your plasma win or polymer window. The plasma cleaner moves polymers, it's very efficient at it, it will kill your window. In principle, that is true, but every single EDS detector or EDS window, there's a slight aluminum layer on top of it that protects the, um, the window from light from the sample, basically filter out cathode luminescence. As long as that aluminum layer is intact, you won't get into the, uh, the polymer, and it's, uh, it's safe to clean. For personal preference, what I would do before cleaning a uh, chamber, make sure the detector is retracted first of all, so it's out of way of the plasma cleaning gas flow. If you're hysterical about it, I might consider just taking some aluminum foil and putting it over the cap of the detector while you're running your plasma cleaning. Um, how long to clean? That heavily depends on your, uh, on your pressure and your power. Um, both the Evactron and IPSS, they have some uh, cleaning curves on their websites, if I remember correctly how long it takes to, to remove the, uh, the contaminants. So those uh, two websites in the resources section is also something um, that's worth looking up. So the next one is... Uh, I showed that you can look at the background tail for charging, and there was a slide, the glass, I had 10 kV of charge buildup. The question is, if we apply 5 kV of acceleration voltage, can we say uh, there won't be charging? Not exactly. Um, it depends on multiple things. As I showed you with the 
the part of being current. It's not just a matter of the actuation voltage. I can get to a steady state at 15 kV where I have no charge just by reducing my current low enough. At uh, 240 picoamps or so, I had about 8, 9 kV of charging, and at 10 picoamp, there was no charge. Going to lower actuation voltage generally means you will have less charge. Little sample depend, but generally you'll have less charge. But you're also typically changing your beam current when you change your actuation voltage. So it's a compromise between the two. There's not really any general rule of thumb. It also depends on the, uh, the rate equations for the charge. How fast does it um, remove itself from the surface? So there's, there's, it is possible to, to uh, define the, uh, the equations for when is your sweet spot. When do you avoid charge? I actually believe that might be in the uh, the paper I referenced as well. Those rate equations. Again, a good resource to uh, to look up. There's a question whether we can still quantify carbon inside the sample when we have a carbon coating, or whether we just remove the carbon intensity from the quantification. In the team software, we basically take the level of carbon coating that's entered into the um, into that box I showed you, calculate what would the peak height be with that level of coating, and then look at the spectrum. Any carbon beyond that peak height will be assigned to the, uh, to the sample. So I showed you, I think I had about 33%, or 33 nanometers of carbon on my glass in, uh, in that slide. If I had gone into the software and entered five nanometers of carbon, it would have calculated that there might be about 10% carbon in my sample because the residual carbon peak would then be assigned to the sample. In the team software, we actually have a button called calculate as well. So if you take a sample with carbon in it, put it in there, collect the spectrum, hit calculate, it takes the carbon peak height and back calculates how thick a layer does that correspond to. Um, and you can then use that to input. Um, so that can be a very useful tool uh, to figure out exactly how much coding and how much do you have in your actual sample. Um, there's a question whether the mass loss for EPM damage can be ejected from the sample fast enough to actually damage the detector window. I, that wouldn't be a major concern to me. As you saw, it was a small salt grain uh, I was looking at, and I was blasting it for high current quite some time, and that goes into gas phase, so it's going to spread all over the chamber before it actually gets into the detector. That's a very long pump, uh, very long pathway, and it's not in the pump path either. So it's not something that would be a major concern to me. The one I would be a little concerned about is um, doing high current prolonged fit milling of samples with my EDS detector inserted. I have seen one of those come back from repair where when I pulled it off and looked at it, um, my suspicion is they were milling gallium arsenide because there was a very nice gallium ring right in the center of the window. But then we're talking about very different removal rates than you would have with just um, decomposition of the sample under the E-beam. That I would not really be, uh, be concerned about. See, we're running uh, very short on time. Um, there's a question about is it possible to have the software calculate the actual landing voltage based on the tail and automatically use that number for the uh, voltage than, uh, rather than having the customer put it in or the user put it in? That is an option. It's, uh, I actually already have it in my test platform. It hasn't made it into a product yet. It's probably coming one of these days. Um, for now, it's not included in our software. We probably will in the future. I think that's all we have time for. I will go through uh, the rest of these questions and answer you by email. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank you for joining us today. Have a nice day.